This is the House Health Care Committee. It's Friday, May 7th. It's uh, now about 12 minutes after 2. We were scheduled to start at 2. But our vice chair also serves on the House Rules Committee. And to be perfectly honest and upfront, uh, I decided I wanted to wait and have her join us, if at all possible. And she is now here with us. Uh, so thank you, Representative Donahue, for uh, leaving the Rules Committee at, and joining us here. Um, let me say at the outset, we had several things on our agenda for this afternoon, and I'm going to modify that and recommend that we spend our time uh, on the children's mental health issues. And we have uh, we have some information ahead of, in front of us from a work group. And we will come back to the other topic of the task force around healthcare, et cetera. We'll, I, I need some more time. I don't. Um, I, we need some more time, and I need some more time to do further consulting with the Appropriations Committee in terms of their process. And so there is time for us uh, to still turn, come back to that issue next in the early part of next week. So with that, um, I think our, the, the follow-up to our testimony on children's mental health, particularly around children waiting uh, in emergency departments, um, as, after we heard different testimony on that. Uh, Representative Donahue, uh, Representative Goldman, and Representative China uh, have spent some time, uh, several times today, uh, looking at, list, you know, thinking about what we'd heard, recommendations we'd heard. And I think you have something to bring to us in a draft form anyway, but I think it'd be good for you to walk us, uh, for the three of you to, uh, in whatever format, manner, walk yeah, us well, through, through the ideas. My, my exciting news is that Colleen did a mini training and I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm going to do a share screen with our documents so that we can be oh. looking at it. And I can be like Jen and I can write in edits as we go along if people have ideas of additions oh. or re, rewording or phrasing and all that. Okay. The, the big picture is we, we talked about it in terms of the real issue is about accountability, sort of keeping feet to the fire um, and immediate actions, and that um, the thought was a, a letter from the committee uh, to the Department of Mental Health and incorporating um, the hospital association as well um, to ask for specific updates uh, on specific issues. And that's what this, it's not even a draft letter yet, it's, it's a list of what we think it ought to incorporate, which we would then follow up by uh, once we've got the, the once the committee input, if there's agreement to go in that direction, we would follow up by asking Katie to turn that into a draft letter. Right now, it's just more uh, kind of bullet points of of what we were, what we are suggesting uh, something like that would include. So I am going to share my screen. It's really fun to watch learning right before my eyes because yeah. she wasn't able to do this this morning and we had like That's right. really different experience. You're cool. <laughs> That's great. Well, Colleen's, Colleen's cool. Um, All right. So, um, so the opening couple of lines is just explaining what we're suggesting, which is a letter to DMH that would be require, requesting monthly updates, not big reports, but updates um, with and specific timelines for action items that include some immediate things along with the short term and planning points for the, the moderate or longer term. And that we would want to incorporate VAS as requested collaboration on some of the items because part of it is about saying, well, this is really, you know, you guys doing this, DMH would be doing this, but they need to really be working together. Um, and then what we have is a list of what, what would be the requests or what would we be expressing as expectations um, that would be in the letter. And, and this, is, uh, this is kind of the, the list of ideas, starting kind of with the, you know, the opening, really thanking them for being very responsive and also um, making note of the fact of, of the memo that DMH already sent us on the commitment to prioritize children in, I, I really abbreviated this, but the Capitol Bill RFI process, if people remember, that was our language about getting proposals from the 
community um, agencies um, for uh, residential programs and that they're gonna prioritize um, children's responses for children for diversion uh, and step down in, in that process. But that's obviously not a you know, rapid turnaround um, for that to, to be created. So the second point is for a continuation of weekly reports, um, but saying we want it on, on numbers and the length of stay, the, the days, um, and comprehensive, regardless of whether they're in DMH custody or not, involuntary or their insurance status, meaning that needs to be in collaboration with VAS and having that data in alignment. So really getting um, accurate tracking of, of the status um, to indicate and that we, we want to know where we want to know where these folks are. That's, that's, that's a very interesting point, Art, uh, in terms of getting a sense of the distribution in the state. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know how heavy a lift that would be. It would seem that like Voss is gathering this by contacting each of the hospitals. So they know which hospital. Yeah. So I don't think it would be hard to make it a chart that indicates. Um, it came to mind because the Rutland legislative delegation uh, heard from Claudio Fort this week and, and we had some discussion about it in the Rutland area. That, that's why I asked them. Claudio is the head of your hospital, right? Pardon me? Yeah. Claudio is the head of your hospital? Yes, he is. Uh, 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 the Medical out. Center. Yeah. yeah. Okay, look at that. I wrote it on there. And which hospitals? This is cool. <laughs> um, the, uh, the next one is the indication that, that, you know, it needs to be immediate that they start soliciting input from uh, the family and peer stakeholders so that they're getting input on identifying both immediate and you know, ongoing process points that, um, uh, uh, so that's, the, that, that shouldn't be a delay in how this is um, being followed up on. Um, the next one is really an important philosophical statement and that that be that DMH needs to start expecting, establishing the expectation um, for our, our system that, that every, moment of involvement should be being used to provide treatment and promote recovery. Um, Can I just say, I, when, when, I read, when I read through this for the first time, that really jumped out at me and I really appreciated that. Uh, yeah, well, that, when that, Brian, Brian's the one who said that and Leslie and I both said, yeah, that needs to be there. That's really what it's all about. Then you have to talk about concrete steps, but. Right. Um, then saying, and, and I know the integration council is not something that new members are familiar with. Um, it was something we established in legislation last year and it's been very delayed uh, because of COVID. Um, but I know, you know, they were in the process now of starting to, to uh, set it up. And that's a council that's supposed to be sort of bringing the rest of the healthcare system on board with what needs to happen to um, implement a 10 year vision that really establishes integration in our healthcare system, um, the whole, you know, parity crisis, and that we would be suggesting that, um, that they use the, the emergency department crisis as kind of a first case sample, you, if you will, of discussing and identifying how does the whole system appropriately respond um, to working and integrating mental health responses. Um, and then we get into the more can, direct. Can I, just, can I ask you just, and I, and I welcome people to just jump in. I think this is, yeah, this yeah, is a yeah. conversation, but I'll just jump in. Um, is, is, and, um, say a little bit more about when you, because you, you, you use the shorthand and it, I think yeah. it's helpful to have other people talk when you say, well, the Integration Council will look at how to integrate healthcare. But what, what, what you're talking about, I mean, you can articulate, but I, I'd like you to just sure. articulate a little bit more about what that yeah. means. Yeah, I can throw out some examples. So, uh, you know, one of the things that was referenced by somebody in, in the testimony in the last few times that, that, that one of the issues is um, private health insurance. Um, 
not you know, adequately providing for the needs in this category that would be consistent with parity. Um, and so that, that, is, that is sort of part of the Integration Council's role is to be talking about, are we meeting the expectations and requirements of parity? So if they are focused as their first kind of situation analysis of how are we creating a more integrated system that's really impl impl uh, implemented parity, they would say, okay, what is going on with this emergency department crisis where the rest of the healthcare system should be playing a role and isn't? Um, you know, should there, you know, Diva is looking separately at this question of, of uh, uh, daily rates for the emergency department. You know, if, if for every other condition, you're in and out of the emergency department, you know, in under 12 hours at the outside, then saying there's a, 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 one, a one time rate, you know, this is what the ED visit is the rate, makes sense. But if somebody's staying there until we resolve this, this isn't gonna be resolved overnight. If somebody's staying there for six days, that, that's a very different scenario. So what is the insurance, including our public insurance, but private insurance as well, what is the responsibility to provide the financial support um, to, to meet a specific need? So, you know, that's just two examples. There are a lot of others in terms of the other, one of the other issues that came up was transportation. Um, you know, how do we meet the need to get people? And if you have a, a broken hip and you're being transferred to rehab, you don't need to be admitted after you're stabilized, but you're going to rehab. You're not wondering, how am I going to get there? Um, so how do we resolve this recognizing it's a healthcare system issue, uh, not just a mental health issue? So this is not a quick turnaround either. Uh, this is more a longer term, but it's beginning that process of, of making sure that we're looking at it as a part of the healthcare system, not just in isolation, because that's what the Integration Council's function is. Okay, obviously we can go back to any of these, but just to, to do the walkthrough. Um, we, we identified as, June 1 for an initial outline, understanding that it may be very incomplete. And this is not a report. This is, this is a, you know, uh, maybe a, a one page outline with columns. Um, what are the current emergency action steps um, and planning steps? And this is something they will have to do in collaboration with VAS so that they are monitoring and we are seeing which have been completed, which are underway, what is the timeline for completion, and is DMH doing this or is this something VAS is doing? And then after that initial one, they continue to provide updates on that action timeline um, with the expectation that it'll continue to have items added um, and progress steps on it on the moderate and longer term um, action steps. So it, it will be very much a, a, a constantly updated monthly statement, if you will, saying, here's where we are on these items. Here are the items that may have been added because of input we've received or things we've identified that weren't on the very first, much briefer list. Um, here's who's doing them. Here's the, here's the deadline and here's where it stands. Um, we want them to, these are things, a lot of this was discussed in the committee. We want them to um, establish the target date for achieving as a first step that the average length of, of, of boarding does not exceed 24 hours. That's not an end goal. That's a, give us a target date for that step of progress. And then the last one, identifying what best practice is for what it should take to assess and 
resolve um, you know, a, a, a mental health crisis in an emergency department and be you know, moved on, whether it's discharged to outpatient or it's an admission somewhere. Um, what is the best practice length of time? And then based on that, what is the target date for achieving that? Meaning no child waiting in the emergency department, but waiting as defined, what is the appropriate best practice of what time it takes to address that type of um, crisis. Um, and then the second piece, if you will, is about very immediate steps, <laughs> faster than what were defined as short term. Um, and this is, this is a request of us and they mean, may need on some of it collaboration and support by DMH, but, but this is primarily about what's happening in emergency departments right now with the experience of care for children who are currently having to wait whether it's 19 kids or whether it's one kid. Um, if they're waiting, um, you know, day after day, uh, what needs to happen right away? And, and I'm aware they, they've said they're starting to look at these, but um, we want to articulate um, that, that we, wanna, we would like to know about and see immediate steps. And, and we give some examples um, you know, I mean, I threw out and, and it was, you know, somewhat in jest, but not really. It was symbolic, like, you know, coloring books. Um, but this is a little bit more concrete. The scope, the scope is about available resources or training to improve the current physical and social environment um, with input from families about what they need. But so this is, this is, this is not about CONs to redesign emergency rooms. Um, this is about right away, and examples are like emergency department or crisis staff being there to provide more direct emotional support and activities and regular information to, to, to parents, to families who have described, you know, being there for hours and hours and hours and not even getting an update on, you know, when to expect something to happen. Um, kids not being asked if they need food uh, and so forth and not having engagement with even the people who are monitoring them. Um, ensuring that children and adults are not being, you know, held together in the same area, um, which we had one report I think I shared with the committee, of, you know, family had written about that. Um, the increase in just comfort items and environmental things like being able to dim lights to try to sleep at night uh, if you're going to be there overnight. Um, use of telehealth if it's going to be things that can improve the patient experience of care, particularly, for example, transfers from the emergency department, you know, from the Northeast Kingdom, for example, where there's no admitting psychiatrist on site. And this might be a way to expedite things. Um, as long as this is part of an improved patient experience of care and not detrimental. But these are really just a list of examples. We're not asking these specific things. We're saying, this is what we mean about immediate actions. Um, and then the final point is just that we're, we're gonna be off session. So it would just note in the letter that we'd be asking for these updates to be sent. Um, you know, to the leadership of the House Health Care, Senate Health and Welfare, the Joint Health Oversight. And obviously, I mean, that's, I think the way it's usually worded, obviously we would be forwarding that to all of our committees anyway, or members, but. So that's, that's the outline. So if people wanna go back to anything or reactions or responses. Well, I, I, I want to just, no, go ahead, Lori, go ahead, Representative Houghton. Oh, you can go ahead. No, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate the thoughtfulness of, of what's uh, articulated here, uh, both in terms of being, setting some timelines, expectations, and, uh, and some values that are combined in this, in this uh, piece that I, that, that's really, I mean, there may be other specific suggestions, but that, that, that's my 
most immediate response. And I want to uh, express appreciation for those who have worked on this. L Lori, and then Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. And um, yes, thanks to the folks who did this. This is really great and that such a good step forward. I don't have specific recommendations. I think the things that come to mind um, are just, you know, I, I was, I was concerned, I believe, with some statements that were made by those who've come in to testify that um, it's a seasonal issue. Um, so I just, I want to make sure that we're, this isn't a, let's get everyone out of the waiting rooms in the next 30 days and not worry about the fact that, you know, what is the issue? Um, and shaking our heads. I think you probably understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, and then exactly. The and I think the hospital association pointed out, yeah, you can say that there's ups and downs. There are more intense times, um, you know, but, but the long-term, the long-term graph shows that it's going up. And, right. you know, when I said before, in terms of best practice um, and, you know, whether it's, if there's one kid who's waiting days, that's not okay. So the fact that it's 19 versus one really right. is not relevant to any of these. Exactly, thank you. Any actions needed. And then my, the second thing is, you know, we had several um, departments come together last week or this week, I forget when that was. Um, and I wanna make sure that collaboration amongst them continues because it's not just the ED we have to worry about. And I'll go back to something I said last week, or was, I think it was this week, that you know, agency of education, although they are doing work, they weren't at the table with the rest of them. And I feel like we're not really hearing from the agency of education. They, you know, DMH, which is great, keeps saying they're doing these amazing things, but I mean, there's such a, a link between the schools and, and children's mental health. So thank you, I guess. Changing that to AHS helps, but AHS, I would also like to have a reference of the agency of, agency here, of education in here. I put that here too. Oh, thank you. That the collaboration needs to be with VAS and also with the agency of education. Great, thank you. And, and But you're right. I mean, one of the things I mentioned in our meeting this morning, I don't know how many people saw the Digger article, which kind of really um, annoyed me a fair amount because it was, um, you know, DCF saying, that they're doing this whole new initiative about um, uh, enhanced foster care for kids with special challenges to bring them in from out of state. And there was a reference to, and this is a big piece of, this will help keep them out of the emergency room because these kids in DCF custody are a big piece of this emergency room issue. DCF was in our committee room Tuesday and never said a word that a significant subgroup of these kids with long waits in emergency departments are kids in DCF custody. So clearly, I mean, it's a really good point to change it. It really needs to be to AHS um, so that it's involving. And, and, you know, I don't know, it might be too hard. I mean, it, it would be really good to identify in those weekly reports and how many of those kids are in state custody. Mm -hmm. We want the numbers regardless of custody, but we want to know which hospitals and in whose custody. You know, I, one other thing I'd like to say is the foster homes. You know, some are very good. And then we also have some that are not. And, um, you know, with, with issues of, of manpower and people out there to support, it's just a concern, let's just put it that way. But actually, I think it's, it's a good point, Woody. And if, if, they're, if they, on their internal end, are working together among the departments, you know, it's going to help them see if there are certain children who are showing up in the emergency department more often who are with the same foster family, you know, 
that that's going to help them idea identify where they need to maybe strengthen their system if that is you know one subcomponent of of the problem well and you also don't want to see them shuffling off to different homes after so after such a period of time and you know it's a very it's a very um difficult process you know and 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 you know i know dmh has had uh or, uh, or is, is it the Department of Families? Um, you know, they've had their issues with some of these, some of these homes and some of these families. And, you know, I don't know. It's just very sad. It is. <clears throat> I could tell you horror tales from when I was a foster parent, and I know when you had those wonderful little kids that you were looking. Oh at. no, I'm not telling you. I wasn't a no. I was a, a DCF foster parent many years ago. So I'm going to just encourage Elizabeth and Art to just chime in yes, and yes, I'm going right. to step back from moderating this afternoon, but uh, I think we'll manage amongst ourselves. So, go, so Elizabeth and Art, feel free to go ahead, Elizabeth. You were you were before me. Thank you very much. Um, I I feel like one of the things that's being left out of the conversation is the family, and that um, you know, there I haven't heard of a protocol for families being at the emergency departments with the kids or whether there's like, you know, services that are being wrapped around the whole family. I know there are outside of the emergency department, but uh, when, a, when a child is in crisis, a family is often in crisis at the same time. And I'd really like to at least learn more about what's being done for families, but also know that um, there is some kind of protocol being provided for what family members should do, or, you know, it's sometimes it, it, like in our family until very, until the last year or so, we all had to go to the emergency room because we don't have, we have one car family. We, we don't have the resources to, uh, we don't have a one car family anymore, but we didn't have the resources to be able to manage, you know, doing that and so what what happens then um yeah so i've just yeah. added and their families the experience of care in the ed we already had like examples being staff who are actually giving support to the kids and giving updates and, and maybe updates isn't good enough giving um support and information to parents i mean that's not to say sometimes the family is the problem we know that but sometimes it's not. Um, it's the nature of the thing. I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in, Art, here. But when families and children go to the ED rooms, are and there's a there's an issue with the child. Is that child taken away from the parent? Um, Brian probably has more direct. Ex my ex my experience and information is no that they, they are not that's unless good. unless there's some kind of an allegation or indication that there's abuse or something yeah yeah the but, family waits with the child in fact that's one of the issues where when we were talking about designs for the new emergency department um, at UVMMC the family input included you need to have a shower accessible for family members who are waiting for days with their kids and can't even get away for a shower. So, yeah. I think I would say it depends what you mean by is the fam is the kid separated from the family? Because like, because if you mean like custody, then, then, then Anne's right. Like if there's a, if there's an issue of child safety, a report would be made to DCF and DCF would make not that decision, not the providers in the emergency room, but, that, 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 but that if the other situations I could imagine where there might be some separation would be if there's some kind of safety or health concern, like during COVID, for example. But even then, like recently when I've been in the emergency room, parents were with children in the rooms. So I think the practice generally is to keep children and their caregivers, whether that's their parents or foster parents or DCF workers or a provider who brought them in, I, the general practice is to keep them together and to try to include the support 
for the children in all of the, you know, in all of the actions there. Right. Yeah, my, my comment, maybe not so much to this letter, although it has a bearing on it. Um, when this all started to happen here recently, and Chair, you, you can answer this probably. Did, did we go to DMH or did they come to us? And the only reason I ask is, it seems to me, and if this stuff is happening, that the people in the agencies and departments that have permanent jobs in those divisions should be doing the you know, if I was, you know, if I worked in DMH and saw this, I think I would jump right on it and let's let's get a fix. Is that happening, or are we is everybody kind of dependent on the legislature to do something? I don't know. That doesn't come out right. I, I don't. No, I, I, I hear what you. I think I, I think I hear what you're asking, and I think, in fairness, uh, this is an issue that has been, that has come to the fore previously. Uh, we've talked about it and Department of Mental Health has talked about it. Uh, and I think it has, it's, it's received, and, and, and just waiting time in emergency rooms generally for mental health services, adults and children, but particularly adults, it has been an issue over a period of years. Uh, and so we've met, we've had, we and the department has engaged with uh, emergency departments of hospitals I mean, there's, there's been, there, there have been numbers of activities to try to address some of this. Uh, in this particular instance, I'll give credit that uh, in part, this was prompted by uh, a letter that was sent to uh, Counterpoint newspaper by a family member, not there with their child, but there for some other reason and observing children, numbers of children waiting in an emergency room and Anne being the editor of Counterpoint reviewed the letter we talked about it and we, yeah i'm kind of surprised we got we it that it. way so well, Art, i i think it's kind of like you know the frog frog in the boiling water and you get used to it it has been a serious problem okay. for a long time a long and it time. does get okay. worse and better and worse and better but it hasn't okay. gone away but it, it unfortunately it falls off our radar in terms of yeah. urgency and i think the same thing happens in an agency because that's it's human, but it, okay. it happened to us as well. Okay. So it got, I, I see, I see what you're saying. I mean, this has gone on and on and on. So well, this is no different to them than well, any gonna, other no, time. No. Except no, that it got really bad again. Really and bad. Nobody raised yeah. the red flag. Yeah. And so yeah. it was this letter that raised the red flag that, whoa, it's gotten really bad again. So, and that, now, I, I want to bring up one other thing, if I can, that has a bearing on this. I referenced, uh, you know, every Wednesday we have a Rutland delegation meeting. We met with Claudio Fort, and this came up. And I was going to bring it up if it didn't, but it came up. He, he, he was very concerned about it. Uh, but, but someone else in the, in the meeting said, well, the 12 beds of Bravo Retreat are going to take care of it. Is that happening yet? I know you, you you're on top of that, or what's the? No, uh, no, that's something that's that's one of those items that like there's so much to to monitor. Um, as far as I know, you know the 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 staff recruitment phase has not reached a point where they. I mean, they have not opened any beds that I know of yet. They are still supposed to happen. You know, we really would need yeah. an update from DMH as to, or from the retreat itself as to where exactly they stand. But they're not going to, that's not going to resolve a single thing for kids. No, oh, because okay. All right. That's, that's good to know. Okay. Yeah, that's that an is adult adults, facility. That uh, is an adult. Okay. Yes. Well, there you go. And that, and that, that was, that was inaccurate information. Okay. That was in part to, it, to address the level of urgency of the problem of adults waiting extended periods in emergency departments gotcha. not enough gotcha. capacity for high need adults hmm. okay thank you yep.
So I, can I ask um, one thing? So in this section, Anne, that uh, you guys put together about, um, or you folks, I always have to not say guys, sorry about that, um, that you put together on the stats that we're supposed to receive weekly. Yeah. Sometimes I feel as if, if we don't ask, if we don't know the questions to ask, we don't get the answers. And so can you, is there like a general statement that you can say any other information that you feel is important for us to know? Just, you know what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want them to get this and say that this is all we want. Spoken like a true Lexus Nexus employee. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or no, until you, right? So you don't know. Right. Again, I'm, Leslie, just jump jump in. I'm 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 not monitoring this afternoon's conversation, just welcoming us to monitor each other. Sure. Um, thank you. I think one of the things that came up in our conversation amongst the three of us was sort of this overarching philosophy that although we, we don't want to have any kids in the ER, there will be times that children are in the ER, and that's what this is addressing, but that what we were hoping was that there would be enough community supports that would preclude emergency room disposition for children so that, in fact, kids would not be going to the ER. And one of the things that came up was, you know, some regulatory comments from VOS, like CONs and all that jazz. And we were saying, no, let's not even go there. Because if we start doing, yeah, let's redesign the ER for this, then it takes away from the community um, supports and emergency um, what are programs that we would like to have in place to deal with it pre-ER. So this is sort of our interim so that we could get to a system that will be pre-ER as much as possible. I don't imagine it would always be that because there will be crises. So we want to have it both ways, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think, I think I, and I forgot, I lost that from the, from the list of our earlier discussion. And I don't know quite how you say it in the negative, but maybe there's a way. What we talked about is that we did not want to see um, proposals that so that basically institutionalize the status quo rather than resolving it. That's so, right. And, and maybe that comes with, you know, maybe when we get, when we start getting, a, a, you know, the action timeline on what the, what the steps are. And if, if one of them says, well, um, you know, doing an emergency room expansion, maybe that's when we say, no, 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 that's not what we meant. But maybe there's a way we can say it right from the get-go in this letter saying, and by the way, don't, don't be coming at proposals that make assumptions. And, and maybe that's saying it by saying, we want to know the, I, I think when I'm, I'm thinking aloud as I say this, but when I look at these last two bullet points, when, when the target date that we want to hear from them to bring it below 24 hours and then the best practice in achieving it, that assumes, if that's what we're trying to achieve, that we're not doing things that allow, that accept stays in ED as a norm and that we, you know, build emergency department capacity to accept that as a, as a new normal. I think when we talked about it, it was sort of a like, well, that's a long-term vision um, because, you know, we were talking about more about short-term, medium-term, and maybe that's the way to think about it is, you know, ultimately um, the community um, supports will be robust enough to not require ER stays, period, you know, and that's just the issue. And that may be in the introduction, you know, it's sort of a philosophical right. statement that that's the ultimate goal is kids don't, we, we were able to intervene, you know, ahead of needing the ER. Wonder if that's part of our expectation. Establish an expectation that every moment of involvement shall be used to provide treatment and pr promote uh, recovery. And actually, I'm going to say no. No, I'm going to ask you nope. not to do that. But I don't want to dilute that line because it's so good as it stands. 
I would prefer another bullet. Um, just saying, you know, ultimately, you know, the, that the emergency room is a lot of place, you know, I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is that the community supports for mental health will be so robust for children that interventions can occur prior to the need for ER, something like that. Yep. Um, I just want to say that I totally agree. I think we all do about that, that we need to um, kind of shore up the um, shore up the bottom before as much as we need to worry about the top or the, you know, that we need to also put a lot more focus on the bottom. And I think that's well said. So thank you. Okay. And, and I think that that, that expectation is kind of, it's good to, to focus on it that way because otherwise it's only implicit. It's implicit in saying, and you better come back with something in that RFI process for um, diversion uh, and step down. Um, and, you know, and, and we do ask for longer term progress and, and not relying on EDs, but this, this lays it out more directly, which I think is good. We had talked actually in the subgroup about listing examples for those moderate and longer term things, and then decided that, you know, that they've already got ideas on that. We're telling them to also listen to families that, that listing them out here was maybe micro work because we had things listed like, look at, it, look at expanding the puck model, um, do uh, early reviews of how the mobile new mobile crisis uh, program in Rutland is doing to see whether it should be expanded and, and adding a lot of detail. And we kind of pulled back on that thinking that, um, you know, that, that might be um, micromanagement, particularly because that was really already their list of things you know, we don't need to repeat the things they already said right. they're going to do. We just want them. We want those in the timeline, in the uh, in that um, action timeline on progress points towards those things. But we don't need to spell out what what they should be. Yeah. Hey, hey Anne. When when and, and I'm still struggling to get this through my thick skull here. A child in a family goes to the ER. The, the child needs to stay. I don't know what the capacity is of a hospital in terms of other patients and other rooms and other things. Can, can they not put this child in a room that's empty if they have it? Well, on another floor, you know, take them to a place that's comfortable and nice with a bed and a... Uh, how many they, beds? Yeah, said, I how mean, how many beds are in an emergency room? And well, that's one of the things. That's one of the things that are in those VAS weekly reports that they're also copying to us now. It talks about what percentage of emergency room beds end up being taken by some of these both children and adults who are staying multiple days, and in some cases, it's it's like a third of their emergency room beds, which is which is a huge problem. Um, so, yes, I, UVMM when Voss talked about that they were occasionally, and and I think this is part of what we're asking them to look at for the environment. You know, they they actually have a pediatric unit, and to temporarily hold a child there, which they said they have done, they discussed that. You know, that seems to be something they ought to look into more. Um, you know, as long as it's not a child, sometimes a child in crisis is extremely disruptive and you can't have that child on a pediatric unit where they're very sick, physically sick children, but other children could be waiting in that much more comfortable environment as an okay. example. Okay, okay. So, so it, it's hard to, it's hard to place them in a hospital. I, I'm, I'm talking about another, well, I, I can only, judged by Rutland Regional because it's all one building. 
you come in an emergency room and if, if you were there and, and you were seen by a psych, psychiatrist and he said, well, he, he needs to stay in a room, they could go to another part of the hospital, walk and take elevators and get in maybe, if it's spare, a room. But you're saying some a lot of these rooms are not, Either he, he might have a disruptive child who doesn't fit into the. Or, or they might they might be rooms where the hospital would be in trouble with uh, the licensing folks right. because it's a room. If it's a normally equipped hospital room, it's got a lot of equipment in there that could be dangerous to have if you have, you know, say an adolescent who's very suicidal okay. and might okay. grab something. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I think we need to recognize. Issues. I think we need to recognize that there are protocols with the, within which the hospitals uh, okay. need to operate to provide yeah. for appropriate safety and gotcha. also appropriate, you know, protocols around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I see. I see. I'm. I, I was stepping back, but I see. Uh, Mari, you have your hand up, and Woody, is your hand up, or is that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask each of you to chime in, and then. Uh, we'll see where we are. Woody was ahead of me. Okay. Yes, but you haven't asked any questions. So you go ahead, Representative Cordes. Well, thank you, Woody. You're uh, very welcome. <laughs> it dovetails with Art's question anyway. And just a reminder that um, even if you, if the hospitals could find a space or a room, you also need to have the staff with the clinical competency and skill um, that could go work in that room. Um, so there, yeah, there's that. Yeah, that's why we didn't want to micromanage. And even the examples we gave, we said, you know, this is just to demonstrate, you know, we're thinking about things you could do quickly and maybe none of these are viable, but we wanted to give some examples, but yeah, we can't tell them how to do any of that because we don't know all of the limitations. Right. Woody? Um, yes, I've just kind of mentioned, and, and it's been partially mentioned before, Department of Education. You know, our teachers probably see a lot of these issues come up beforehand, or nurses, school nurses. It'd be nice if there'd be some sort of interaction. I'm not saying there isn't, but... Um, there should be some, some working together with these different agencies. It's like somebody said, um, you put the emphasis at the very beginning rather than in the emergency room. Right. No, right. Woody, they, they are actually they are. doing quite a lot. Say, there's a lot going on. I think it's fairness to them. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, there's, it happens everywhere and all the okay. time, but there's, there's a great deal of there's a this year there was a statewide trauma informed uh, training for teachers all over the state, um, just to get ready for reopening the schools and and looking for to, to try to be careful with our students, you know. So I think the teachers are doing a really great job of that yeah. actually. Yep, and then the other issue is. Um, the age of the children, you know, quite often when a child reaches 18, you know, sometimes that's it, you know, for, for health and health care and, and help. And, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, high school students that, are, you know, maybe it's their last year, they're 18, and um, they, they may be having issues. I, I don't know what the age limit is to help some of these children that turn 18. Um, but that might it's, be something that you might want to consider, Dan. Woody, that's a big problem. That that really is. And in terms of even the emergency room crisis, the problem with adults, which run the range of adolescents, like what we what Bill and I heard last uh, fall from uh, um, Spectrum. Spectrum in in Burlington, um, that includes you know 18, 19, 20 who are not the same as somebody who's 40 or 50 um, with those needs. I think what we're trying to do here is, you know, focus on this specific subpart while knowing that 
it then needs to broaden out and, and deal with a much, we, we have a system as a whole in crisis in terms of community support. Just in case people weren't watching, I was listening and adding, um, adding some pieces here from what was being said and you know that this action timeline that gets added to as input comes in specifically says inclusion of the input and involvement of the agency of education and the relevant the other relevant ahs departments children and families you know diva so forth who will be who will have to be a part of a lot of these um action planning Go ahead, Elizabeth. I was just going to ask, who who do you foresee signing this? It would normally be the committee leadership on behalf of the committee. Okay, just wondering. And I think we, I mean, frankly, the whole committee has been so involved. I think we could have it come under the signature of all the committee members. Leslie? So um, I'd just like to comment on this question of, you know, sort of older adolescents, young people. I think in the beginning, in the data collection piece, and if you slide it down a little bit, yeah, um, it does say children and adults. And it might be interesting to add there only a comment about analyzing the adult trends to inform future policy or something like so that it does we don't like just drop that idea particularly i think there's a reference to transitional youth which are often right. thought of as 18 you know in that period of 18 to 20 who um aren't captured when you collect the data for youth and sometimes when you say children actually it's like you know 16 to 20 or something yeah, so we could use that data, you know, that's collected as just part of the whole process then, uh, you know, as we go on, I guess, is what I was wondering. Okay. Well, that's not what I was thinking, but it's complicated. Okay. I, what I was just thinking is that we use the opportunity um, and maybe we just say length of stay for all children up on the first line of that bullet and transitional youth. And that's where that gets captured. And then later on say, also analyze the adult data to inform future policy. Because we say length of stay for all children and adults. So that's what I was thinking about. Okay, yeah. So what we have to, I mean, I don't want to create a weekly report that's, I do say that, we're good. yeah, that's no longer going to be a brief weekly data report. And we have to also keep in mind what we already require as data. And that may be what needs to be changed to draw from. But, you know, we, we do have existing reporting requirements that unfortunately is not broken down by age. Um, and th this really may be a separate bullet that says, um, you know, uh, revise, look, look at revising data collection to be able to effectively um, uh, do planning that incorporates the needs of transitional youth, something like that. Yeah, right? I just that, want to include adults too. I mean, maybe it's just say disaggregate data by age and consider policy as, you know, as identified by, I mean, what if there's, you know, I'll be ridiculous. What if there's, you know, 50 adults in emergency rooms there over two weeks in the entire state? Um, and because, no one wrote a letter to counterpoint, we don't know about it or whatever. So I just don't wanna lose track of that potential problem is what I'm wondering about. Right, right. So what we're really talking about is, um, is this, I meant this to be a separate sentence, not to 
um, that that we want them, you know, it's probably, it's not a part of these weekly reports, but that we want them to begin to maintain disaggregated data by age in order to inform future policy. Yeah, something right? like that's good. Yeah. And then maybe up at the top. So since you've said that there, then in the pre, in the bullet up above, take take out for all children and traditional youth. Add that, and then remove adults there. So I'm going to suggest that we step back from uh, micro perfecting micro the letter at this point yeah. as a whole committee in in this. I mean, I think getting ideas out there, and then and then given that you and Brian and uh, Ann can help integrate further suggestions, I think would be a good way to go. Yeah, because I would really be pushing back on that, Leslie, because I think um, getting this immediate reporting is very different from beginning new systems of reporting and they do not currently um, break out ages like that. So mm -hmm. I don't think we can really say report on weekly numbers of yeah. children and, and we'll take uh, the transitional out, youth. Fine. Yeah, because that's what yeah. Foz is doing anyway. They're just doing it on kids, and that's fine. But I, oh, they're I, doing it kids and adults. Oh well, that's good because that's what we. Well, I know that we don't want to continue. They're not breaking out tr transitional youth ages, so that's that's more ah, a future. I see. to maintain it. So, but then at the bottom of that sentence is and identifying transitional youth who are identified in data. How does that? You still want to keep that in there? <laughs> No, to begin to. Oh no, right. No, no, we wouldn't. We wouldn't be putting okay. it here again. Yeah. Can, can I suggest that we yeah. kind of step back from too much further wordsmithing at this point? Yes. Yep. Okay. I just want to give um, Katie at least some logical thing here. Well, I think you have. Oh, good. Yeah, she's <laughs> been she and she's been listening too. So. I mean, I think we've got here good input and good, um, you know, a good product to turn over to the skilled writing of our legislative council. Right. No, I think I think this has been a good, a good. Uh, I thank you for the work on it. And I think the input this afternoon has has been helpful as well. Can I just say one more thing? Sure. Can you move up the um, move up to the top the uh, sentence about um, that we all really liked? Oh yeah, uh, this one. Yeah, why not move that up higher so it doesn't get lost? Uh, make it. It could be the opening. Yeah, or or you could bold it just so Katie knows about it. That's all. Yeah, well, we'll put it top so that Katie knows we want it on top. She, I think she's still here listening, so. Hard to know. There. Yeah. Anything else that awesome. folks want to bring forward and, and just to suggest that, you know, if you have further thoughts uh, upon reflection, uh, be in touch with uh, Ann, Leslie, or Brian. And we will we'll take a look at this again uh, in a more formalized form uh, early next week. Great. So before we wrap up, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chair, um, it, would there be time to take uh, the two minutes to hopefully have a poll on um, the uh, shackling issue now that we actually have a draft written? Yeah, and um, sure, why don't you put it in front of our committee? And I think uh, we can perhaps just, I think there was a strong consensus to support that. Yeah, and I've, I, I, right, that's why I didn't think it needed more discussion. We just didn't have any language to actually have a straw poll on. And I emailed the language to everybody. Um, it, it's just a sentence that
cross references the prior session. Take this off the screen, and yeah. now that you've learned how to put it up. Can you learn how to take it down? <laughs> well, there, that's oh, there it is. Stop share. Cool. Okay. <laughs> um, so I can, yeah, if people don't have it dog, handy, right? if um, if people don't have it handy, I can read it to you. It simply says that the that the um, report back um, from the uh, Joint uh, Justice Oversight Committee, if they come up with new proposals, that the new proposals have to meet the requirements of that session law that said we have to enforce the shackling. But let me find the exact wording to- Is that, that's section E314, is that what you're referring to in our email that came at 1135? Uh, that, I, that I don't know. Let me, uh, that might help me. 11. Um, it's the one that was sent oh. at 1129. Ele 1140. The later one was giving the, uh, the, cro the cross reference language, but the actual language proposal, um, it's in a section that requires a study and report from the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, which includes potentially recommending changes to the existing system of contracting for county sheriff transports. Um, and what it adds, the sentence it adds says, any recommended changes shall comply with the Agency of Human Services policies on the use of restraints in accordance with 2017 Acts and Resolves number 85 E314. So that's what the proposed amendment is, adding that sentence. That basically means that they should have the proper protocols to not use inappropriate restraints with children. Right, right. It's cross-referencing when in 2017 we said the agency can't be contracting uh, with, you have to cut off the contracts with sheriffs if the sheriffs aren't complying with the law. Right. So does that mean like, I mean, how many sheriff departments are there in the state? So like each department has to- County. Be just by county? Okay. Yeah, so each county. Was that 15, 13, 15? I can't remember. But then it would be individual, each sheriff would have to acknowledge their knowledge of this law or something. Is that how it gets? The Agency of Human Services already, I don't know what they have set up. They already have it set up. They already have a system. This proposal in the budget is to relook at the system whereby we contract and maybe having it shift just to county regulation. And so all this is saying is whatever you recommend, you have to keep this in force. Right. Which was an important policy uh, implementation. It, I, I don't, I, I'm just gonna take as a sense of the committee that there's a consensus to support having that embedded in any change that, that is moved forward by the agency. Is that fair to say, looking around the committee? Yeah, I'd say that you have, the, we have the support to, asked to have that integrated into the language of the budget. Great. Thank you. Good, and thank you for following up on that. So again, I think um, you will work with uh, Katie McLinn to bring a further product to the committee. Uh, we'll work with uh, and again, a reminder that the Appropriations Committee is in the beginning process of the uh, conference committee. And so they will be updating us. Uh, Lori is providing them with information based on what the work that we've done over the past several days. And there are a few more items that will come before us uh, over the next uh, period of days as uh, we move into next week. Uh, and uh, we have in front of us, uh, uh, Representative Black will be presenting 4.30 on uh, Tuesday, and uh, that will bring that to a close, and we continue to have S22, which we will put on the calendar at the appropriate time, which will bring that to a close as well. So, um, 
there may be other issues that emerge that we're not uh, aware of that could be brought to our attention by the Appropriations Committee or by others. Uh, and uh, my understanding, my latest understanding is that, uh, so we may, our schedule next week may be slightly different, uh, but we haven't heard for certain. Uh, but uh, as we move into the final weeks of the session, uh, we can anticipate that there will be some times when we will meet and other times when we will uh, be attending to other issues, such as conference committee, uh, following conference committees, uh, such as S3, uh, which is also coming to the floor next week, I believe, uh, where we had a, a significant input to that bill, even though we never had possession of the bill. And uh, just to be clear, um, the chair of the Judiciary Committee has reached out and asked if our committee would present those sections uh, five, six, and seven on the floor of the house and Representative Donahue is prepared to do that. Yes, it's one of those fluky things where I won't be presenting it when the committee presents the bill because I'm not a member of the committee and can't, so they have to actually hold off and just say, you'll hear about this later. And then after they're done, they will. And after the vote on the appropriations amendment, whatever they do, then I'm the first one to rise. And then I say, and now. Okay. Well, we'll trust that all gets sorted out procedurally. So good. Get that with Betsy Ann all straight. Great. Well, we appreciate your willingness to do that because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that's important. It's also an issue that's difficult for to convey and understand at times, but we're confident in your your uh, willingness and ability to do that so so anything else with that i think we'll bring our committee meeting to a close for the day and we'll see each other uh we'll keep keep your eye on the on the agenda because i think tuesday could be a very full floor day given that uh, a lot of things are moving on and there is a token session on monday uh, so Tuesday could be a very full floor day, and it may mean ultimately that we do not have committee uh, or that we have a very brief time for committee, but then that the will, things will, will move them along into Wednesday and Thursday. So, so do stay in touch uh, as we try to make decisions about how best to move our, our work to completion.